Rod Williams is the author of the book, The Real Deal. And Rod's life took him in a bad direction when he was 17. It actually led him into a life of addiction and eventually even to prison. Now, Rod's with us today along with his police officer father, Chris, and they're gonna share the story of Rod's fall and redemption. So welcome to both of you. Welcome, Rod, welcome, Chris. We're it's really to glad to have you. So you just released this book that tells your story, but I wanna start at the beginning. So, Rod, you were raised in a Christian home uh, by a Christian dad who also was a police officer, and yet at 17, your life started to take a real spiral downwards. Tell us a little bit about that, and how did you end up there? Yeah, that's right. I was raised in a Christian home. Um, up until the age of 17, I went to church every Sunday, sometimes yeah. up to three times. Yeah. Um, both my parents worked for the police force. My dad was a police inspector. Um, but even though I went to church for 17 years, I knew I wasn't a Christian. I never yeah. made that conscious decision myself to say yes to Jesus Christ. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Right. And then at 17, I decided uh, that church wasn't for me, this God stuff wasn't for me. And I went to explore, I suppose, life. And uh, I started going around with a different group of people outside of my church friends. Some of them were sort of experimenting with drugs, it was weed at the time, just recreationally. And uh, to me, it seemed as if they were enjoying it, they were having a good time, and, and they were. And uh, I ended up doing what they would do, and I ended up experimenting, I ended up smoking weed. And that decision to smoke weed took me into a world that, that promised me everything, that promised me pleasure, uh, popularity, and power, uh, because before long, I started to then uh, take other drugs, try mm -hmm. other drugs that were being handed round. I was enjoying them, I was enjoying the buzz that these drugs gave me, um, that feeling that I'd never experienced before. And um, within 12 months, I was actually dealing drugs. I was dealing ecstasy wow. tablets in nightclubs. Um, within two years, I was smuggling drugs. I was living on an island called Guernsey, which is an island mm -hmm. in between the south of England and the north of France, 60,000 population. And I was importing drugs into the island. Wow. Why, why, people ask me, because I wanted money. I was making money. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a pretty quick slip because, and, and where did that lead you then? You start dealing drugs, you start smuggling drugs, and it ended up in heroin for you? It ended up, um, seven years after smoking weed, I was a heroin addict. I was, uh, you know, working in the finance industry at the time as well. So I was living two lives. I was just I suppose dealing drugs, smuggling drugs, ended up becoming a heroin addict because I was pursuing this um, this lifestyle that I was hoping was going to bring me peace, contentment, mm -hmm. you know, but even if I had hundreds of thousands of pounds, um, I wasn't happy. There was something missing, this void in my life. Ended up becoming a heroin addict. Within 12 months, 23, I lost everything I had. I lost my job, my house, relationship with my family were completely destroyed. My health deteriorated. Ended up running off to Thailand for two months, became addicted to methamphetamine over there. And early 2002, I ended up living in a squat, in a crack den in Brixton in London, um, living with other addicts in complete squalor, in complete darkness. I mean, I thought there was not, no hope for me. I thought there was not gonna be a better day for me. Um, people who knew me at that point didn't think there was going to be a better day for me. So your life was almost over. It was almost at over point. at that point. It must have been extremely hard for you to watch as a father, Chris. Tell me the emotions you went through as you started to see this unfold. There were, there were a lot of dynamics going on here. I was a serving police officer, um, an inspector, I commanded men, uh, and I worked in an area where there was a high drug problem, and it's one thing quite one thing to deal with other people's families who were going through this. You do it mechanically, you do it professionally. When it hits home and you don't see it coming, it comes right out of left field. Wow. And you're a father, that is a whole different dynamic. So you've got the professional and then you've got the personal thing going on here. And it was, uh, it was a shock. I saw Rod deteriorating. I saw his mm. health going and uh, but the thing was, you know, he was in denial. Uh, I was challenging him. So I was, you, you I was stepped in, you tried to, to I help tried him everything. Out. I gave him the gospel. I gave him, if you like, all the good stuff that yeah. I knew he should have heard. Um, and all credit to Rod, he wasn't ready to hear it. And he said, it's not for me now. I don't want to be a hypocrite. So uh, on that one regard, that was the only plus out of it. But I was dreading really what maybe the, the short term, even the long term future was going to hold for us as a family. What did that do to your faith while you watched Rod go through that? You know, there was a kind of numbness came over me. There was a, going to church was one thing, standing 
watching the choruses and the songs being sung and standing there numb, mm. unable to enter in. It was because my mind was racing with all the, the possibilities of what might happen. So my faith wasn't really shaken, but it was, it was compressed and it was almost anaesthetized in a sense. I, I, it's difficult to explain. I, I would say you have to be there, but I wouldn't want to wish that on anybody. No. No, you wouldn't. And, and in, in your book, you call weed a gateway drug. Now, in our country, and I think in many parts of the Western world, weed is getting more and more social acceptance. It's just, you know, something you would do like a glass of wine, a lot of people yeah, think. Sure. You don't agree with that. Tell us. You say it's a gateway drug for you. How did that lead to heroin and, uh, and methamphetamines? Yeah, well, I mean, I would say definitely um, weed is a gateway drug. It certainly was for me. Um, not everybody that smokes weed ends up a heroin addict. Sure. But um, I've worked with heroin addicts, and the majority, I would say 99% of heroin addicts started by smoking a cannabis joint, a, wow. a weed joint. Um, I've seen 50, at least 15 of my friends now end up in a coffin um, because they started with a cannabis joint that led on to heroin addiction. And I've worked with um, people with cannabis psychosis as well. So I've seen the psychological, the mental effects that, that weed has on a person. My goodness. So that, that landed you, your whole life fell apart. You ended up in jail. And is that right? I did, yes. In 2002, um, I decided to import drugs into the island myself by carrying the drugs on me. Previously, I would usually pay somebody else to right. do it. But I owed a drug debt. I had to pay it. I was given one week to pay the debt. So I took crack cocaine and heroin into the island and I got busted. I got arrested and I got, ended up getting sentenced to four years in prison. Wow. And tell us how you met Christ. How did the turnaround start? Well, being in prison gave me a lot of time to reflect. I guess it would. A lot of time, yeah. and the decisions I've made. And there was a real cry from my heart to want out of this lifestyle. Mm. And my mum and dad, they sent me in testimony books. Um, the Cross and the Switchblade, Run, mm. Baby Run, you know, common stories. And I was reading these books, and I was reading how these lives, these drug addicts, these gang members, uh, people who were into extreme violence, how their lives were being radically changed and touched by the power of God's love. And this freedom that, that they, were, they were experiencing and walking in after this encounter with God. And I was jealous. I was reading about this freedom that I didn't have, and I wanted it. And in June 2002, I decided to see if this Jesus I was reading about was the real deal. Could he really forgive me? Could he really give me a brand new start and release me from, from the baggage of, of addiction and that, that sort of that, that, that lifestyle that I'd been living in? So, so one night, I'd been locked up for the night. And I decided to give God this opportunity to show himself real to me. And I got down on my knees and I leaned over the bed and I just started to cry out to God. I just started to say, God, if you're real, please reveal yourself to me. I'm sorry. I probably said sorry about a thousand times. Wow. And I just, yeah, I just cried my heart out to God for almost an hour. And uh, when I got up from my cell floor, I didn't, there weren't any bright flashing lights, it wasn't a vision of Jesus, but something powerful had happened in my heart. There was, I knew I'd, I had a supernatural encounter with the living God, that Jesus had answered my prayer, that he'd forgiven me. And I, I felt that a peace, the Bible says, surpasses all understanding. Mm. And uh, I felt this peace I'd never had before. I was excited and I stood up in my cell saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I knew he'd answered me. Wow, that's amazing. Now, just quickly as, as we wrap up, so Chris, I know there are probably some parents watching right now who have a son who's maybe in a similar situation like Rod or they can see where this is going. What word of encouragement would you have for them in a moment like this? I, I could speak as an ex-police officer, as a father, as a Christian. Don't ignore the obvious. Hmm. Don't be afraid to confront the situation. Uh, whether you're a Christian or not, you just should be aware. Be socially aware, but be personally aware. If as a child of yours that's starting to behave differently, look differently, um, uh, dropping out of college, mm. failing at work and doing that, watch the signs. And if you are not professional enough or you haven't got enough knowledge, ask somebody who does know about it. But don't be afraid to confront because it's tough love. Yeah. Love will, will draw you to actually confront the situation mm. and not bury your head in the sand and then just turn away and hope things will get better because the world does rely on just hope and wishful thinking. So um, I could just say this, uh, there was a famous quote from Winston Churchill who, who said in a speech during the 1940s in Harrow University in England and part of his speech was never, never, never give in or you could say never give up 
I never gave up. Um, I wasn't going to let Rod go, and God wasn't going to let either of us go. You may have a word um, just that you want to share, Rod, um, to people who are maybe at the beginning of an addiction, or maybe there's somebody who's watching who's, who's just caught in addiction right now. What would you say to them? I would say there is always hope. Um, people said there wasn't any hope for me. Mm. But when I took that step of faith and asked Jesus into my life, I encountered his, his love and his peace and forgiveness. And uh, God made everything brand new. And that is God's promise for every single person that would take that step of faith to him. You know, he promises to make a message out of our mess mm. and to release us from all the baggage of the past. And I would just say to them, you know, take that step of faith. Give Jesus an opportunity to show himself real to you. And you too can find out that Jesus is the real deal. You know, he paid, he paid a huge price for our freedom 2,000 years ago. And he offers it as, as a free gift to every single person that is watching here today. Well, I so appreciate that. And I, I could not resonate more. And if you're watching today and you're struggling, maybe you have a friend who's struggling or a son or a daughter or a parent, or you yourself are in a place where you start to see your life slip away into addiction. Uh, two things, you'll want to pick up a copy of this book and it's just called The Real Deal, Rod Williams. His dad, Chris, is here with him today. And um, also you'll probably want to call our prayer lines, one uh, 273 4444, the number's on the screen, and we would just love to pray with you. And even if you want to receive Christ as your Savior, whenever you're watching this, whether you're watching it now live or online late at night, those prayer lines are always manned, and we would be thrilled to pray with you.